Today we're going to talk about Mac architecture. There's a lot of people out there right now talking about going towards Mac architecture. At the same time, there's a lot of people that really do not understand what Mac architecture really is. When I'm talking to customers, when I'm talking to my friends, when I talk to my peers, and we sit down together, they say, John, what is Mac architecture really? I've read the blogs, I've watched some videos, they go through the acronym, microservices, API first, cloud native and headless, but I still really don't understand 100% what it is. So in this video, I'm gonna go through the acronym, I'm gonna go through Mac architecture, and hopefully by the end of it, you'll have a much better understanding about what Mac architecture is, why it's important, and most of all, why it's important to you. So let's not waste any more time, let's get to it. So in my past, I've worked with many different types of architectures. All the architectures I've ever used always have one theme in common, which is about separating areas of concern, dividing things up, separating them out so they're easy to develop, easy to manage, and easy to deploy. But previously, all of these architectures, all of these developments always ended up back in the same place, and that's a monolith. What happens, the monolith forms as the system evolves. All of these layers and all these separations gain dependencies. So it gets really hard to understand what is actually going on. If I change this little bit of code over here, what is really gonna happen? You change something over here and it causes issues in a completely different part of the system. Therefore, as time goes on, it takes longer and longer to develop. It gets more and more risky. So things just slow down over time and you become less agile. So this is where microservices come into play. So microservices can be thought of as components organized around business capabilities. All microservices are independent of each other. That means that teams can develop those services without impacting each other. They can be individually developed, tested, and deployed. They talk to each other and the external world using APIs, usually a web-based API, typically REST. They focus on storing and managing their own data. They don't share it with other services within their system boundaries so that they can stay independent and isolated. They're ultimately loosely coupled, independently deployable services. That solves the problem of things becoming fused together, creating those interdependencies that make it really difficult and really tricky to continually develop and deploy applications quickly. The other big problem with previous approaches to architecture and system was that of integration, integration, integration. I spent so much time working out how to connect systems together. You first start with a stack to make sure you at least got a common language like Java and maybe some standard frameworks. But even then when integrating different vendors, they all tend to have their own approaches, whether that's SDKs, whether that's APIs. They may not have any of those and you have to spend your time importing massive batches of data into their systems or setting up polling and syncing to make sure you've got two systems aligned. Integration was a minefield because it was never consistent. And this is where the API first component and Mac architecture comes in. What it means is before you even start thinking about building a user interface, before you start thinking about building a connector, or before you start building a CLI tool, you think about the APIs first. What the API first approach means is that you can't have half the system over here with a bunch of nice microservices and APIs, and this part of the system here only available through a web front end. API first means there's a complete coverage across the entire system. Every part of the system, everything you do in the front end or any other part of the system, you can do through an API, which means that integration becomes much simpler because you're doing it through a standard interface. And no doubt that's also going to be done in microservices, which means that it's also independent. Another big thing you need to think about in the past was not just the software architecture, but also the infrastructure and the systems that your applications and software ran on. You had these huge teams that would just manage your infrastructure. Scaling could be a nightmare, especially when it came to monoliths, because you had to scale everything. It was really difficult to pull it apart and scale that one bit that was struggling. You often had to scale everything and replicate the whole thing. Not to mention how difficult it was to actually scale the unexpected peaks. Because often you would create the infrastructure that you think you needed for peak and you let it run and you run it over capacity for some time. 
And then when you really needed it, it might not be enough. And it just took too much time to add more infrastructure and versions of software were a complete pain. You might get a new version of a CMS that has some really nice features and the business wanted those features, but you know what? It's gonna take three months to upgrade it. It's gonna take three months to upgrade that software and migrate everything from the old system into this new upgraded system. And not only that, your e-commerce system might have a really nice upgrade as well. And that might take another three months. Now you've got two systems that you need to upgrade. And these can have interdependencies because obviously they're fused into the monolith. Now you've got this really difficult, complex, risky plan to upgrade your software to get some new features. And you've only got the same software you had in the first place. So all of your technical resources are focused on just upgrading, not innovating, and not differentiating your platform. And this is where cloud native comes into play. SaaS vendors that are pure cloud native deal with all the infrastructure. You don't have to worry about it. They will implement cloud native features to deal with scaling. All you need to do is work with the vendors, work with your partners on the SLA, and they deal with the scaling of all of those individual pieces of software that you're bringing together. The other cool thing about cloud native SaaS providers is there is only one version of the software they'll deal with constant upgrades of that software. And it's not an upgrade across the whole piece. Because remember, if it's Mac architecture, all of these pieces are individual microservices. All of those are going through upgrade paths without you even knowing most of the time. And good Mac vendors will make sure that everything is backward compatible. If there is a new feature that you need to implement, it doesn't affect anything else that you have and you don't need to do any upgrades. Some of the biggest challenges we've had in the last couple of years is the explosion of digital channels in which you want to deliver content and functionality into. Those could be web channels, voice, IoT, native applications, and all of these channels and devices are basically available to every single touch point with your customer. Nearly every touch point for a customer is now a digital touch point. One in which you need a consistent experience, consistent content, and consistent data. We also need to think about future experiences like augmented reality, mixed reality. And this is where Headless comes in. By separating out the presentation layer from your content, from your functionality, from your e-commerce, means you can build separate heads, separate experiences on top of the same API and microservices infrastructure. It means you can reuse content. It means you can publish content at once and it goes everywhere. It means you get the same consistent experiences across all of your digital touch points and you can optimize them in the experience themselves rather than hardwire them into the business logic. This means you can build new digital channels, new digital experiences and innovate in areas that were really difficult to reach before. Like most things, when it comes to Mac architecture, the whole is actually greater than its parts. It gives the business far more agility and speed to try new things and innovate. The modularity means that you can do things in smaller iterations, whether that's building new things or migrating from the monolith to the new architecture. You can choose the pieces you want to move and you can do them in smaller iterations. Mac means you can focus on choosing best of breed vendors. You can choose the suppliers that are fit for your business. And the great thing about Mac architectures overall is that you can customize them to work with your business. You can use the APIs to build integrations that work well with the way that your business works. Finally, using a Mac architecture allows you as a business to focus on those things that allow you to differentiate against your competitors that allow you to innovate. And it removes a lot of those mundane and technical activities that don't differentiate. Okay, that's what we've got time for right now. But if you found this video useful, please scroll down a little bit, press that like button, I'd really appreciate it. But for now, it's time to say thank you, goodbye, and I'll see you next time.